Okay, The Excesses of God, also from 1923. So this was written and published in the same book as uh, Divinely Superfluous Beauty. And I put these three here on the same front page <clears throat> for a couple reasons. One, they fit. Um, but two, they, they all seem to be about this excessive beauty, uh, just how awe-inspiring and beautiful nature is. <clears throat> So here we go with the excesses of God. Notice it starts with a question. Is it not by his high superfluousness we know our God? Uh, so we see a repetition of that word superfluous again. We've seen that now um, in another poem. And we, uh, we also see for the first time in our, our study of Jeffers here this idea of a God. And look at what his answer is to the question, uh, the opening question. To equal a need is natural animal miller, mineral. All right, so basically to just do what is necessary. Remember, superfluous means to go beyond what is necessary. To do, so to do what is necessary is natural animal or mineral. But God goes beyond what is necessary, right? His high superfluousness. The God, the wild God of nature. So this God, look at the things he does, uh, or, you know, it, whatever, whatever this God is. Uh, we don't really know much about it at this point. But what it does is it flings rainbows over the rain, beauty above the moon, secret rainbows on the domes of deep sea shells. Look at that sequence there. You know, the rainbow isn't necessary right? Uh, the beauty above the moon. We, we don't need those things, but they're there. The secret rainbows on the domes of deep sea shells. If you guys have, you know, looked into seashells, there's just extraordinary, like, patterns and beauty and color uh, in those. And, you know, they're not anything that most people ever even see, right? They're just down there, you know, snail lives in them, and then snail dies, and then the shells that were once so beautiful just, you know, decay into the sand. Um, and yet even there you find beauty. Um, and now he moves on in this series of, of excessive beauties, superfluous beauties, and says uh, another one of them is, the necessary embrace of breeding is beautiful also as fire. Here he's talking about sex, um, whether it's animal sex, human sex. It is necessary right? Breeding is necessary. We have to do it to propagate our species, um, but it's more beautiful than it has to be. Like fire is, I mean, we need fire, but it's more beautiful than it has to be. Um, even the weeds multiply with blossom, right? Not even the weeds to multiply without blossom. So even weeds, even sort of parasitic um, plants um, have blossom. The birds multiply uh, with music. And so now he comes to this conclusion. There is a great humaneness at the heart of things. Interesting that he'd use that word there because he seems averse to the human in so many contexts. But here there's a, a, a humaneness at the heart of things, an extravagant kindness. So there is an essential sort of kindness um, at, the at the center of things. And this is a fountain that humanity could understand and that it would flow likewise from us if power and desire were perch mates. Think about that last conditional there, the if. If power and desire were, per were perch mates. So what he's saying is this humaneness and kindness would flow we would understand it, and it would flow from us if power and desire were perch mates. So, uh, you know, he's using that image of the birds there perching. Um, and the implication is that as we currently live, power and desire are not perch mates, right? One is they're either not together or one is above the other. Uh, so whatever it is, that is uh, separating them and keeping them from being perch mates is preventing humanity from understanding this humaneness and kindness 
Um, and it's also preventing that humaneness and kindness from flowing from us. Uh, and if, if there is any sort of solution to this difficulty, it seems like it has to be in finding a way to make power and desire perch mates. So to bring power and desire together in a way to make them partners. Uh, so we'll want to think about what exactly that means. But notice in these opening three poems, what we have here is this notion of the, the awesome beauty of nature um, and the way this beauty is superfluous and excessive. It goes beyond what is merely necessary. Uh, and that is a way in which we understand the divine. It's through that excessive beauty. Um, and so that's where Jeffers' sentiment as a poet originates.